eating. <laughs> Very loud here. Okay, so we're recording now. I have a, a, co a colleague here in my office who's watching this live. Um, so welcome everyone. I figured out how to turn on people's cameras this time and I figured out how to turn on the live captioning. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen. And I had a tiny welcome, day two welcome. There we go. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I, I think that works. Um, let me say play. Do you guys see a welcome to day two? Okay. And my, uh, I've started recording and uh, my mute is off and all right. So uh, again, today we're just going to talk about examples and some theoretical issues. So that means we're going to start with Simon, who has a really nice uh, outline of how that works. And then I have some examples using the software. Um, as always, I had too much stuff yesterday. And so I did last night look at my examples and try to reduce the number of slides. So I think that'll go a little better, I hope. Um, I don't remember if I warned you, Simon, I just want you to open up a browser and point to, to your site because I think it's a fabulous site and um, newcomers may not know about it. Um, and then maybe if we have time, Felipe has another example. And then um, Makan will talk about his working group. That'll just be a few minutes. And then I just have some final thoughts before we open it up for questions. Um, oops, I have this stupidly on posting things, but that's all right. Okay, so the first thing was I did turn on these captions. I hope that helps. Um, that's what it said to me. So I it did a screen capture. Um, so I did convert the first day's lecture. It's on, it's at YouTube on, on my account, which is fun with GPS. And uh, I did figure out how to turn on the captions that YouTube makes in English. And so they're not perfect. I found out it takes hours for those to be created, but they're definitely better than nothing. I think there's a possibility I could go back and fix some of them, but I can predict that will never happen. Um, I'll post the slides for both days later today. I didn't get a chance to do that last night. I'm gonna follow up with an email uh, with direct links to people. Uh, I imagine People that signed up for the class aren't here, and you know they might watch it after the fact. So I'll go ahead and send the links, and uh, that's that. So those are my announcements for today. So I'm going to say stop the share, and I'm going to say that um, Simon should uh, share. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm as Kristen said, I'm going to talk about uh, models and methods that we need to use when we're doing GNSSI water monitoring. So uh, a few statements at the start: measuring water levels using this GNSSI R is basically fundamentally pretty simple, as you saw yesterday. Um, but there are some other factors we have to take into account when we're measuring water level over something like snow, which is a very static uh, measurement over a reasonable long period. So it's some ways it can be considered easier than snow. The water surface over the footprint size that we're looking at can generally consider, be considered to be flat, although it may not necessarily be considered to be smooth, which we talked about yesterday. Also, we have to worry that the water levels can change rapidly over a satellite tower, and therefore that requires care. For lakes and rivers, mainly, we can still use the uh, daily average for making the uh, computations, but for the sea with the tides, we may need to use the, we generally need to use the sub-daily routine. We also may have to wonder, realize that water may also change to ice in certain areas, so I would look at that. And the insulation itself can be problematical and influence what you'll get. So we're going to take a look at that first. So a lot of this is from my uh, perspective, a practical overview of having processed many sites around the world. 
So in terms of site selection installation, there's two sort of things here. Is either you've got a site that's been pre-installed for purposes of say land, vertical land movements or surveying, uh, and you have no control on its installation. So it's whether that site would be good enough for GNSSIR measurements, or you've got your, your planning your own installation and you have considered all the factors for a good site. So I'll give you those factors. <laughs> Basically, you would like a site that has a good azimuth range and has minimal clutter in the field of view. Uh, and in addition, it's good to have a very modern receiver that's recording multiple GNSS uh, systems, preferably in line X3 and with a sufficient sampling grade. Also, you probably don't want, or you do not want, elevation cutoff settings in the receiver. You want it to measure all elevation angles. A lot of times, and especially in the past, they would set up cut off elevation angles of 5, 10, or 15 degrees, which is bad for when we want those low, uh, low angles. So I'm going to go from the perfect site through to the, the worst site. So a perfect site, theoretically, would have a full 360 degree reflection zones like this one shown here. There's basically no obvious clutter in the reflection zone area. So you don't have any extra unwanted multipath to deal with. You want a reasonably good height above the water surface to ensure you have the sufficient number of SNR cycles to actually derive the, the peak in the long Scargill periodogram. And you want the antenna in a good location on that platform. So reflected and direct signals are not blocked. So this one here is a really good site. The antenna right at the top has no nothing blocking it. You have a great field of view. You've got 360 with no clutter. But you don't really get many of these. And they're naturally very expensive. So you need like a not so perfect site, very, very similar. Um, it's, this one's about 20 meters from the water surface and again has no obvious clutter in the reflection zone. But in this case, the antenna is mounted on the side of the platform, somewhere on one of the sides here. So there's potential for obstruction of the signals and multipath on the platform itself. So you might not get that full 360 degree view. It limits the azimuth range. So in most of the time, you're going to install a GNSSI on land. So this will always limit the usable azimuth range generally to about below 180 degrees. So something like piers are a really good option. They have a reasonable height above the water surface and you get a, as much of a asthma view as you can get. However, note in this case, the pier on the left, this is from the Seven Estuary, um, Western Supermare. There's a very big tidal range in that region so, and it's so large that actually that reflection is owned so dries out twice daily, which is the plot on the bottom, the blue dots there are the uh, reflection uh, estimates. And you can see that uh, at around, well, 51 meters, you're getting measurements of the beach and not the water itself. So that's the only one caveat you might have with something like a pier. Most likely you're gonna get something like a uh, site that's on a headland. So again, you get a really good azimuth range. You often get largely uncuttered reflection zones again, but note that the site on the left here does have islands out in the distance, so you can lose low elevation angle data. So a more challenging site, this is one in Mexico. The site is on the side of a hill around 63 meters above sea level. The average azimuth range is more limited, so you're getting down to, for this one, between 160 and 260, about 100 degrees. And you are, it is very possible to get multiple off, off the hillside itself, which causes additional noise in your, in your measurements. Still pretty good site. <clears throat> now to the very challenging sites. Now I'll have a caveat here. None of these sites were installed for GNSSIR purposes. So this is just up there, there. They put, were put there mostly to be next to the tide gauge for vertical land movements but you have to watch out. So the one on the left here, this is Gibraltar. It has obviously a very, very limited azimuth range. It also has boats coming into that region. The one in the middle is uh, Alicante. So while it's got a reasonable azimuth range, you've got piers and boats uh, blocking those, those multipath uh, signals. Uh, the one top right is Hillary's in Australia. It's on a pier with lots of uh, boats, so you can see that those would probably cause 
uh, additional noise in your measurements. And then the bottom two left, uh, again, on the right, I think that's Ibiza maybe. Uh, again, you just got lots and lots of yachts in your field of view. And on the one on the, the bottom right left, uh, you can see the where the antenna is, there's also a big pier in your field of view. So these get more challenging. You still can get stuff out of there, but it's not a site you would generally pick if you were to install one yourself. Um, again, very challenging sites. This is a site in St. Martin. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday about having ships come in. So the plot on the right shows a nice day, no shipping. Uh, the plot on the left uh, has this big ship docked there, generally for a few days. So you, you lose a lot of the signal. You lose a lot of the uh, good signals or good measurements from that site. And then here are the no goes. Uh, some of the worst ones, ones where you can't really get any measurements from. So the one on the left, the antenna was installed there for security purposes, not for GNSSIR, so uh, fair to them. But the antenna is only just poking up above that concrete wall. There's a fence uh, also in the way, uh, so you get very limited measurements from that site. The one in the middle is in Almeria. So one thing you've got is the... Uh, Hills where you're getting the measurements from in the background, so they block all elevation angles uh, that you would want to use. So you can't get anything from that site at all. It is also low on that flat on that roof and away from the corner of the roof, so that's also blocking your, your signals. At the bottom there, uh, one of the sites is uh, in the Antarctic region. So that one is one we meant we talked about yesterday. That it's only about one meter from the sea level, so really it's too low to get a really good SNR signal uh, sinusoid to actually pick a peak. And then a, a funny one on the right: the the GNSS is there, but there's a tree right in the way for most of the signals. This is actually a new example from today. I actually saw this site today and I had a look at it. This is from Norway. Um, the plot on the left, the antenna there, really nice on a pier. You can see it's got over 180 degree uh, field of view for uh, for the, the site. And the bottom left is the actual uh, uh, Lomskargal periodogram heights, um, color coded as to azimuth. And you can see that sometime in the middle of the second day, at about five o'clock, we suddenly only get measurements from uh, above 160 degrees. So I can't confirm this, but I presume a ship basically uh, came in and docked at that uh, pier. We also have, if you look on the right, if you look, uh, it also has mountains in the background of the fjord. And if we look at the minimum elevation angles as a function of azimuth in the bottom right there, you can see that those uh, certain regions, like, like 50 to 150 degrees azimuth, that you're not getting anything below six degrees elevation angle. So it has two, it's a good example of two of the problems with the sites. So as mentioned yesterday, one of the problems we have with water level measurements, especially ones where we have tidal measurements, is we have the time varying surface effect, H dot effect. So Water levels can vary rapidly even in the time of satellite pass, mainly as all tides. So here's an example from Seven Estuary. This is probably one of the, you know, this is the biggest, one of the biggest tidal ranges in the world. So this is an extreme example. Um, but plot on the left is the reflector heights. Um, each dot is a satellite pass, and the gray and the black line, vertical horizontal line, is the time length of that pass. So um, the tides can change quite rapidly. So the color coding is the amount of change in height of the arc segment. So the one we got, uh, the arrow points to the one which has over two meters change in height over the pipe, the reflector period. And that uh, signal is shown on the right here, color coded to the actual reflector height. So we see that uh, at low elevations, it was around 19 degrees. By the time it got to 12 degrees, it was down to about 17. So you'd have to care, account for this. So what it does is cause a shift in the peak of the long skyward periodogram. So instead of the oscillation frequency being f equals 2h, 2 over lambda h, it becomes the equation there, which has the h dot tanny over e dot uh, 
uh, effect. So H dot is the rate of change in the height of the reflector at the time. E dot is the rate of change in the elevation angle, and E is the elevation angle. So if the arc is reasonably short uh, and you know, tides are not really big, we can assume that both H dot, E dot, and tan E are constants. We basically take the average, and that gives us a, an ability to correct for that. However, while that is an ability to correct for it, we still need to know H dot to get H. And we don't know that because we don't know H. Um, here's another example. This is for breast, which is about a reflector height of about 70 meters. So I've uh, color coded them. So uh, blues are rising arcs where the elevation angle is going up, the satellite's rising, orange are fallen arcs, and the black lines are tie gauge. We can see that when the rising arc is on a rising tide, it has a ex large and expected reflector height. And it's the same for falling arcs and a falling tide. The orange ones to the right of the black lines, and the blue ones to the left of the black lines. Uh, so, and consequently, it's the same opposite for falling arcs and a rising tide and rising arcs and a falling tide. So you have one um, caveat there is if you only had rising arcs or falling arcs, what you would see is almost a shift in phase of your tides. But generally, you always tend to get both rising and falling arcs to counteract on that, and we can use that. So uh, here's another example. This is uh, ROTG, which has a new tidal range of nearly 10 meters. So it's another big one. So it has a H dot of up to a few meters. Um, so on the top there, these are the residuals after taking off the tides. So you get uh, blue is the observed residuals, and you can see there's still a tidal pattern in there and orange is predicted from the tides. So we can account for the H dot effect in a few ways. So one way we can process the data as normal and fit a curve to the results and then take that curve's gradient, so uh, take a spline or something like that. And then from that, we can calculate H dot, tan E over E dot to then correct for it. So that curve, as I said, can either be spline or it can be a tidal harmonic fit if the main cause of the tides, if the main cause of that the uh, H dot effect is the tides, which in most cases it is. Um, if we look at the, the, the plot on the top, we turn to a plot of observed versus predicted, we can see that those residuals are mainly to do with that H dot effect. So one caveat here is to be aware of long arcs. If you want to use long arcs, the longer the arc you are, the longer the time is, the more of that time variance surface effect you're going to get, and it's going to be harder to correct for. So don't always go for as big an arc as you can have. The second model and effect we have to account for is the tropospheric or atmospheric delay. So any microwave signal that propagates through the atmosphere will be delayed. So in GNSS positioning processing schemes, they estimate the tropospheric zenith delay alongside position coordinates using the mapping function. In GNSS IR, we also experience this tropospheric effect. It's a combination of a a slight change in the elevation angle that the, the signal comes in and a delay along the, the, the path. So what it will do is will cause a shift in the estimated reflector height. So instead of the oscillation frequency being, again, F equals 2 H over lambda, it becomes the equation on, the equation on the right. And this bias is always negative and it's elevation and height dependent. So, uh, for reflector heights that are relatively small, a few meters, very often people have ignored this, saying that it's small enough to not do uh, not account for the effect, but it really can't be ignored for high sites. Um, basically, you can easily correct it by stretching the elevation angles prior to calculating the long scargo periodogram. You have effectively put an uh, elevation correction in there. The main change is a height bias. But if you have reasonably large tides, it will also appear in the estimated tidal harmonics as a reduction in the amplitude of a few percent. So you do have to worry about it. So here's one example. This is a lake in Kentucky, 90 meters above the lake. Um, what we, I did here was take little different elevation angle arcs because it was high enough, I have good enough that I can split it into small arcs. And what we see here, the blue line at the top is a gauge nearby. So we've got the gauge heights, but it's not, it's offset from the results. And then the color coding is the elevation, average elevation angle of the arc. 
Um, we can see that for low elevation angle arcs, there is a bigger bias. And as we go up the elevation angles, that bias decreases. This is the, uh, for sight, so like breast, which is more normal. So this is centimeters above the water. And if you look, one the blue is without the tropospheric delay and the orange is with a tropospheric delay accounted for. And you see there's an offset in the results of around 11.5 centimeters. If we go a bit more extreme, this is AC12 in Alaska. This is 68 meters above. And you can then start seeing, so uh, we have two different elevation arcs. We have one between two and 14 and one between five and 10. You can see two sort of effects. One, uh, there's an offset of around four meters and two meters between two different elevation arcs. But we also see an increased scattering in the non tropospheric delay results. They're much worse. By the time we get to the most extreme, this is AC59, which is the highest one above sea level I think we have. Uh, it's 295 meters above the water, and you can see there's an offset of at least 10 meters, and basically results are, are virtually nonsense. If you include the tropospheric delay, you actually see a really nice signal from there. Okay, the next thing we have to worry about is interfrequency bias. So in GNSS processing, it's well known that the estimated positions are related to what is known as the antenna phase center, which is a, a electronical point, but not a physical point. Uh, and the APC is different for different frequencies. In the GNSS community, they use, they've used special techniques to measure that APC for all major antennas, and they have files, the IGS antennas files, that tell you what those APCs are for the antennas. So in GNSSIR, the reflector heights are also relative to some phase center. However, it's probably not the same as in positioning. This means if we use multiple frequencies, we'll get different reflector heights. So this is an example for a site Garibaldi in Italy. The black line is a tie gauge offset uh, from there. And what I've got there is just the GPS L1 and GPS L2 signals. Uh, they were processed separately, and we can see that while they follow the, the tie gauge, there is a bias between the two. Uh, that bias in this case for this antenna is around uh, 15 centimeters. Uh, we can do that for Garibaldi for all the different frequencies, and you can see the bias relative to, to the GPS L1. So in general, what we do in the, in the software is remove them by mapping them to the G01 signal. One thing to note is that that interfrequency bias is different for different antennas. So the site, the plot on the right is a site TN01 Tenerife. The blue is G, uh, L1, orange is L2. Uh, they swapped antennas there from a Leica LEI8504 to an LEIR20, and you can see a remarkable difference between the two uh, biases. The next thing is, as I said, that uh, the water may not always be water, it may be ice. So in polar regions, we can find that the sea lake freezes. At that point, uh, we'll be measuring ice and make it differences from, say, a nearby tie gauge, tie gauge which won't be affected by ice. This is uh, from whatever perspective is a good thing or a bad thing, whether you, you know, want to measure that or not. Um, frozen water, uh, and Felipe mentioned this yesterday, uh, has an interfrequency balance. The water, it's uh, nearly zero for ice. The plot in the middle, so the, let's go from the bottom, bottom top. That's the G and SIR L1 dailies minus the tie gauge, and you can see that over the winter periods, you get a... a a buildup of ice, so you, you will see in differences from the tie gauge. In the middle, we get the interfrequency bias between the L1 and the L2. Uh, while, when it's ice, there's very little bias between the two, and when we have water, uh, we have a bias about the 15 centimeters. We also uh, have different power when the signal is reflecting off ice to water, so you can see that in there, and that can be used, all these things can be used to indicate whether you have water or ice if you want to get rid of that effect. We also should remember that the, 
GNSSI are also measured for position. Most of them that are out there were there set up to measure vertical land movement for the tide gauge. Um, so here are a couple examples uh, of this. So one is in Mayotte, uh, GNSSIR. So the daily is on top, the tide gauge is the next one down. Uh, the difference between the two is the third slot plot down. And then at the bottom, we have the actual GPS vertical. So for this site, uh, over the period of 2018 to 2020, it uh, had some movement due to magma chamber movements in the area. But what we can see is that both the GNSSIR and Tiger Gauge do not see that because they both are measuring to the same water level for them. In the middle, this is uh, a site on the Great Lakes. Again, the daily GNSS on top, the Tiger Gauge and the next one down. And the differences, so the blue dot is the actual law differences. You can see that the actual vertical is showing it's, uh, that site is subsiding over time. If we put that subsidence in, then uh, we get a much more flatter, the purple plots in the, the middle there, uh, flatter sea level difference, which is what we would expect. So uh, there's something different going on between the GNSS and the tide gauge. The one on the right, uh, and then one on the Great Lakes, again, we see a, a trend in the difference between GNSS and the tide gauge. Um, but that trend in this case cannot be explained by the vertical land movement. So there's something else going on there, either the gauge or the GPS site. One of the other things we talked about yesterday and what I said earlier is also, while we can think that the water level is smooth, uh, we can't always expect that it's not. Uh, it's rough, but it's not. Sorry, it's flat, but not but smooth. Um, so if the waves become too large and the reflected signal decorrelates, and we can't height, estimate any heights. So here's a really good example of a uh, substation in Southwest North Sea, Bly Bank Wind Farm. You can see it's it's about forty six meters above sea level. You get a really good signal. The orange line is significant wave height nearby. Um, so when the significant wave height reaches uh, above around one, just over one meter, the signal decorrelates enough that you just can't get uh, water levels from that site. Uh, here's another example. This is um, one in Alaska. Uh, it's on that this, uh, peninsula in the middle, so it's actually getting reflections off both sides of the peninsula. And if we plot the uh, the reflector height we're getting for it, and um, we plot those that are on the eastern side and those on the western side, we see sometimes that we only see ones from the east, and other times we often see only ones that come from the west. So basically what we're seeing is the waves, the wind blowing in one direction, uh, some are sheltered in the bay, and others are getting the full effect of the, the water, the, the waves. We can look at this in more detail. So one of the models for um, scattering electromagnetic names from rough surfaces is the beckman spitschina model. There's also the Raleigh criterion, which is very similar. And it says that as uh, your, your elevation angle to the surface and the roughness of the surface, as they change, you'll get an area that's uh, to the right of a line like this that's uh, incoherent and the right to the left is coherent. So that kind of gives you an idea that the you can get uh, when you'll get uh, good signals. So here's a plot on the left. The top one is a wavelet for a um, satellite when the water in the area had a, there was a significant wave height around half a meter. And the one on the bottom is when the significant wave height was about 1.6 meters. It's the same satellite, same frequency, just a different day. Uh, if we look at there, we're getting a really good signal for the one at the top up to around 11, 12 degrees. At the bottom, we're only seeing a really good signal up to say around four degrees. So the plot on the right is where we've uh, taken, we've managed, we estimate this cutoff elevation angle every time. We plot that elevation angle against significant wave height, and we see that uh, these are the plots from the results for this one site, EPL1, which is again in the south, 
uh, north, south north sea and we see that uh, that elevation cutoff angle does indeed relate to the significant wave height so we can use those elevation cutoff angles and estimate significant wave height from the reflectometry the curve here depends on several things it depends on the wavelength of the signal the height of the antenna and the period of wavelength of the waves So the next thing, and this was talked about yesterday, was the maximum resolvable reflector height. Uh, this is that site in Alaska, in AC-59, which is nearly 300 meters above sea level. This is the plot of that uh, effective maximum resolvable reflector height as a function of azimuth and for different frequencies. So the bottom plot here uh, on the right is well, we'll go to the top one. That's for two second sampling. We see that that Nyquist or the maximum resolve reflector height is for a lot of the points for say L1 is actually under the, the 300 meters of the reflector. So you should not get, you would not get signals from that uh, GPS L1 uh, at that site if you had two second samples. If you went down to one second sampling, uh, that's maximum height is now about 400 meters and you would be able to use the estimate from L1, L2 and L5. If we look at a few others, um, so what does it mean in terms of other heights, you know, what are more normal heights? On the left, this is one that's about 10 meters above sea level. Uh, 30 second sampling says that you should be able to resolve to up to about 15 meters for L1. The one here in Bermuda, we're going to go up to about 22 meters. And again, for 30 seconds, uh, that uh, height is now not resolvable for the L1, but slightly resolvable for L2 and L5. And then if we go up to some, uh, sorry, near about 60 meters again for 30 seconds, we wouldn't be able to again resolve any signal from that site. So we'd have to go increase our sampling to get there. So a lot of the questions, a lot of people always ask, what's the uncertainty of the, the results? And it's quite a hard answer to, um, question to answer because it really does depend on each site. It depends on the environment around it. It depends on the height of the site. It depends on the waves, uh, potential waves in the area. Uh, it depends on the instrumentation you've got and uh, other things and the uh, sampling we've got. It also depends a bit on the methods used, whether you're using just a long Scargill periodogram or you're doing, uh, as Christine will show later, the uh, index and R uh, method, or you're using something you've, they fit a spline to the results, or if you're using comparing to get the spline, you're not really comparing. It's not a real comparison because you've already smoothed the data out. In general, um, the long scargle periodogram, individual arcs are generally on the order of 10 to 20 centimeters. Uh, for 15 minute arcs, instead, if you're doing something where you're fitting to a lot of data in the same arc, you can get least squares. With least squares, you can get around five centimeters, a little bit better. If you're talking daily results, you'll get in uncertainties around one to five centimeters. And for monthly, around one to two. The plot on the right was just one. This was a summary of lots of different papers and their, their estimated RMS. Uh, the green is from a Kalman filter types uh, one. The red bars are just along Scargill periodograms. Um, just showing that in general, there is a slight increase with tidal range, but in general, you're getting the same sort of RMS in most of these ones. This is for the individual long scargle periodograms. This is the RMS for those sites, and we've color coded them to the mean tidal range. So you're going from the best sites are uh, four centimeter individual RMS. Uh, it just shows that it just gradually increases for the different sites depending on their whatever their environment. If you go to the daily for the same sort of sites, again mean tidal range color coded. We then drop down to some of the best ones of between that one and two. And here we get all these sites. All these sites have less than five centimeter RMS difference. 
Okay. So. Thank you so much. Um, what time is it? Let me look at my, my watch. Oh, yeah, 1231. Um, so uh, if any of you have some quick questions, um, why don't you go ahead and uh, type them and we'll ask them and then I'll start on some examples. Then we'll take a break and I'll finish the examples and we'll do that inverse SNR method that uh, Simon referred to. So does, can you unshare your, uh, um, Unshare your or uh, unshare your presentation. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so uh, let me see. Any questions? I mean, it's okay if you don't. But um, there were a couple of questions that are already answered. Um, yeah. If you want to highlight, um, there was a question about the. Uh, offshore platform asking if the is the data for the blind bank uh, public available Simon? yes it is uh, there's about one two three four at least five uh, platforms in the southern north sea where uh, either they're from netherlands or belgium and they are one of them you have to apply to get the data but it's freely available once you apply for it and the other you can just get it. The one second data as well, so which is what you need because those platforms are quite high up. Oh. Um, okay, I'm gonna, we'll take more questions, uh, maybe right before the break or something, but let me go ahead and go to the next section. Oh my gosh, why is that showing up? Okay. I don't, there it is, A2 examples. So let me say, does that say measuring non-tidal signals? Yep. Okay. So, um, so my task is to show some examples using GMSS Reflect, following on Simon's explanations uh, of the, the theory behind this and also some of the pitfalls. And actually we have some common sites, so I'll be able to go through some of these things a little more quickly. Uh, we usually start with lakes because uh, there's not the time variation, there's not the H dot effect. Uh, but I thought this time to be a little different, I'll show a river. This is Vessel in Germany. Um, the GPS antenna, GNSS antenna is up here. Um, uh, yesterday, day one, uh, we went ahead and already started on the azimuth and elevation mask. This only has about 90 degrees of azimuth at best. Uh, we checked the maximum resolvable reflector height. Uh, at this particular site, uh, we requested that the agency uh, operated at 15 seconds, so we're all good for that. Uh, we, I only translated a single file, and we checked to make sure our, our mask was reasonably good, and we ran GNSSIR for a single file, or at least we covered those things. Uh, the next steps would just be to create more SNR files and to estimate H for each of the arcs, which is what uh, Simon was showing. And then we want to turn it into water level. In this case, rivers and lakes, I typically use daily average. Um, what is it? It's what it sounds like. It does a daily average. Um, one of the issues is it's really not just for water, it's for uh, any environmental parameter where a daily average is sufficient. So it's also used by the snow code, the ice code, and the soil moisture code. It has two required parameters other than the station name. If you don't know what a median filter is, it basically says, I don't wanna look for outliers by using a um, standard deviation. So I'm gonna use a safer median, and then I'm gonna tell you how much the individual arcs can agree with that median within a day. It's just a lazy way to get rid of outliers. And then the number of required values is just an acknowledgement that would you want to compute a daily average with five arcs and compare it to a day with 100 arcs and say they're the same? No, you wouldn't. So it's just an extra thing. If you don't care, you can set that to one or something. Um, so it's fine to start with non-optimal values. This uh, code takes a few seconds to run. So I just usually start with 
25 centimeters or 0 0.25 meters is the input here and a requirement of 50 tracks. Um, I, one of the things I just, uh, you know, I make a lot of plots just so I know what's going on. When I know what's going on, I turn them off, dash plot false. But basically, I, I usually like to see uh, which constellations are contributing the most. In this case, uh, the orangish is Galileo, uh, red is GLONASS, GPS is blue, and um, black is the total. So there's well over 100 um, at this site every day, uh, even with only a small azimuth range. And I, I did circle a place where that does seem to drop. And so that's a little warning. And one of the reasons why I make these plots is so that you can kind of learn what your data set is doing. Um, why are there more Galileo retrievals than GPS? It's because they have more frequencies. They have fewer satellites, but they have so many frequencies. GLONASS almost always has the fewest reflector height retrievals because they only have two frequencies. Uh, GPS has the most satellites, um, but only three frequencies, and a, one of those is only on some of the satellites. Um, so then you run daily average, and this is, I didn't used to have this if you used the software before, but this is just basically everything. Uh, no quality control. I haven't applied that median filter, and what that median filter would tell it is, if you find the median, you only allow certain a certain range around that median. So even though this looks ugly with all these outliers, they're gone. With a rational, well-chosen uh, median filter, you're never going to see them again. And typically, uh, for lakes and rivers, I, 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 I'm looking at the seasonal changes, so I don't spend too much time worrying about the individual tracks. So here is, you know, uh, what is this? A week of data. Uh, in Germany, when the river was rising very, well, in my opinion, very quickly, like if I can go for a walk on the Rhine and notice that it's about to overflow, that to me is a, <laughs> a sign of a river rising quickly. Um, what's shown here is the median value, and then the blue dots are all the individual arcs, of which I said there were almost 100. Now, these are, I'm not going to use the median I mean, at the end of the day, I'm going to report an average, but the median at least shows you that the outliers have mostly been removed. And there's a missing point part as well, and that's not normal, and that's probably indicating to you that that 0 0.25 meters is too small because that river is rising so quickly. So it thinks those are outliers, but it's not. It's a signal, and so that's another clue that you should not assume that 0 0.25 is some kind of magical number, you should use the one that's appropriate for your uh, site. And this is what the daily averages look like, which is what that code is doing. And like I said, it's what the uh, snow and soil moisture people are using as well. In general, uh, I think uh, uh, both Felipe and Simon and, and I show reflector height backwards so that water level changes um, show off the way people are used to thinking about it. Um, what about analyzing data from cheap sensors? I know that there are some people on the call or they were on the call yesterday that express interest. So I wanted to at least point to this. I picked Vessel because there is a low cost data set. As one of our use cases, Makan put it together. There's an associated paper with lots of details. And he's also put the data on, on GitHub. So it, all the links are there. This is me pointing to it. I'm just going to tell you some things about how to analyze that data set, uh, even though Makan goes through this. But the data are in the NMEA format. You can use NMEA to SNR to uh, compute SNR files. Uh, the biggest difference is I require that you input the latitude, longitude, and height of the site. If you have a RINEX file, that information is in the header. Uh, those of you who know the NMEA format might say, why don't you use the latitude, longitude, and height in the NMEA file? Partially, I don't want to write more code, but the second answer is I don't trust it because it's not very high quality. But, you know, I, I if you've made um, 
that if you've saved that information in a GNSSIR JSON file, I will use that so you don't have to keep typing it. Uh, so down here, um, I do show you that if you save the lat long and height in your GNSSIR input, um, I'll save that information and use it so that you don't have to keep typing it every time you do the NMEA to SNR. Uh, what are we using that lat long and height for? We're using it to compute the elevation angles and the azimuth angles. That's why the uh, NMEA format, often people have uh, integer values for the elevation angle and azimuth. That's not good enough. Uh, there are ways around it, and people have shown good results with fits to that integer data, but I don't think it's trustworthy, so I have the code as a default using IGS orbits. So then you know it's good. Um, I also uh, encourage you to decimate. There's a decimate option in both RNX to SNR and NMEA to SNR, and most of the NMEA data sets I've seen are one second, I mean, they're not all, but um, you don't need that for a GPS site that's one, 10 meters tall. And all your code's gonna run 10 times slower, or in this case, five times slower. So just an option. So um, I wanna point you, so again, that use case is online and I encourage you to look at it if you're interested in a, a NMEA example. It's the only one we have. Uh, when I was uh, trying to find something new to show you uh, compared to past classes, uh, you might have noticed Simon showed things from the Great Lakes. It's, it's, it's kind of a classic place to look for lake data. Um, and one of the uh, cases I gave you in the email assignment was from Lake Superior. Um, and I didn't really find any. What I did find was just caught my eye, but I want to just show it to you as a kind of a cautionary tale, which is an expression meaning, be a, well, means beware, but maybe be afraid. Um, this is a, a site that I, I got the data from uh, the NGS, which is the National Geodetic Survey in the United States. They don't run the site, but they archive the data, so that's great. Um, I don't know, Simon, I can't even remember now what lake this is. That's how bad it's gotten. But it's kind of interesting if you, it has pretty good view right here, right on the water. But unfortunately, there's this big, you know, concrete platform to the south. So you're not going to get reflections there uh, or you will get contaminated reflections. Uh, and um, so it has some good features. Remember, though, we still have, this is the northern hemisphere. We're going to have no data here at the mid-latitude. So that's another problem with it, but give it a shot. Um, I got reflections, no problem, which is not surprising given the picture. So I you know, went ahead and analyzed years and years of data. And then when I made a plot, and again, this is the raw data. I haven't, uh, this is the one I said, no quality control. Well, this would really confuse my daily average code because I don't have random error here. I do have some random errors. I've got a systematic error between two obviously different data sets that are showing up in my results. And um, I spent some time looking at the logs and uh, I discovered that I can't remember which is which. One of these is all the L2 data and the other one's all the L1 data. And really what it means is there's a bug, in my opinion, in the software being used to create the Rhinex files. That at this site, the people that are making the files available have inadvertently put the L1 data in both columns for the L1 and L2. That's what explains this. Now, when someone tells me something's L2 data, the code believes them. So it uses the frequency for the L2 SNR data. And this is what happens when they get it wrong. And, and you would, I, I, I would be shocked if, if a company did this on the carrier phase data, it wouldn't be fixed within days. It would be. So it hasn't been fixed and it's unfortunate. So just be aware that sometimes these things happen because 
These companies do not sell SNR data. They compute it. They are selling the carrier phase data and the pseudo range data. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, I will go a little bit. Okay, this is me saying that. I don't, I'm not trying to be mean to the people that are doing that, but I, 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 I did find it at multiple sites for multiple state departments of transportation that operate these sites on the Great Lakes. So it was a bit um, um, unfortunate. So the next thing we're gonna do is talk about measuring tidal signals and I'll do that for about 10 minutes and then I'll stop. If there are issues, again, it all starts with a good site mask, checking the sampling rate. I appreciate that Simon did that already for some of these sites, the H dot or, or the H dot correction. And there are these interfrequency biases that we do remove. Now, I haven't said anything about removing the troposphere effect because I don't ask your permission to do that. I do it. I mean, it is true that you don't, it doesn't really matter if your site's only a meter or two meters, he's right. But I don't want, you, you're gonna have to try to turn it off. And um, in fact, my, my goal is to add better and better troposphere refraction models and so that you can use the one you prefer. That's, this is not something to be ignored. It is something to remove. And right now it's removed automatically. There are surface effects and the length of arcs is something you should think about. I'm glad that Simon brought that up because it's in one of my examples. So I'm gonna start with uh, SC02 and then I think I will stop for the break. Uh, it, for me, it was the first place we ever, um, along with Chalmers and Onsela, uh, got good reflections from seawater. I mean, in some ways it's a, you know, if you look at the picture on the left, there's a car and a mountain or a hill behind the site where you get no reflections, trees and the top picture. But again, if you look to the south, that photo to the, to the east and the south, there is water there. It's hard from those photos though, to see that that site is actually quite a bit of a distance from the, the water. Um, so that's gonna impact how, how, how many elevation angle limits or how those limits are set. Now I'm not gonna show you all the details, but uh, this is a paper that uh, Simon and Richard Ray and I wrote on this data set where we looked at it over 10 years. And that, that the results we had for the daily averages and the monthly averages are consistent with what Simon said, you know, one to two centimeters for those daily averages and monthly averages. And we did that, and I, I, I circled this. We only used GPSL1. So we were only getting 30 to 35 measurements per day because we were trying to use a consistent data set to do this analysis. And we got good agreement in the tidal coefficients, which are shown left, but I'm really just trying to 30 to 35. That was from was it 2007 to 2017 or something like that. It was a 10 year time period. Well, now since I think the year after that or two years after that, they've been running a modern receiver. And uh, so I wanna show you how much better it is now. And that's really the future of GNSSIR for water levels. Um, but in general, I want to remind you, the defaults in QuickBook are not going to work for tides. I showed you what it looks like for bare soil, where the antenna is two meters above the ground and the ground never moves. But for uh, sea level, it's more interesting, but it also is more challenging. You want to make sure that you've set the defaults to let you see anything. Um, the nice thing is it's an old PBO site, and they ran things at 15 seconds. So for the heights at this site, we don't have to worry about the uh, Nyquist. Um, until you have that experience, Simon and I and Felipe, we know what the Nyquist is, but until you know it yourself, you should run the code to check it. So reflection zones, I don't have those in my head. I always run the app. Um, I typically use five to 15 for sea level. But you can go down to lower elevation angles, just be careful. And we're gonna use mean sea level as the reflector height. What that means is this tool knows the ellipsoidal height. It's gonna use a gravity model to get a mean sea level value. So you can use that reflector height for uh, coastal sites. And, and uh, Simon showed something similar to this. This is when you make no azimuth restrictions. So I, I don't tell it you know, to cut this part out. I'm just 
getting a start. Um, but see, 5.8 meters, that'll be mean sea level. And when it's high tide and low tide, there'll be some variation there. Um, this is if you ignore the request <clears throat> to put in reasonable restrictions like, okay, it's not zero to eight, it's actually maybe three to 11 or something like that in reflector heights. And I said five to 15, in fact, five to 13 is gonna be our preference here. And, and here I've, I've circled it, the default's five to 25. And the way this code works is blue is good and you have blue in all the wrong places because you're looking at soil reflections or similar, or you're just looking at antenna issues. So what you want to do, and here is the quick look command, you want to use different elevation angles that are correct for that site. You want to restrict the reflector heights between, in this case, I'm choosing between 3 and 12. And I'm showing you the better data just because it makes it easier to see the mask. Uh, the L2C data are better than the L1 data, so you'll always, you, you know, your retrievals won't be as good. But if you look at L2C, you know you're seeing something good, and all the blues are above these default QC parameters that are shown in dashed lines. Um, this is the mask that uh, Simon showed before, and this is the one basically that I'm using. And um, I make more files. In this case, I specify GNSS as the uh, orbit, I think because in 2021, it wasn't the default yet. Uh, I have my GNSS IR input. Um, Simon mentioned that you don't want super long arcs, and that's correct. And so here I'm saying not longer than 40 minutes. Now that actually maybe should be smaller, but that's what I'm using here. And these frequencies, 120 and 5 are GPS, 101 and 102 are, are GLONASS, and here are these massive numbers of Galileo frequencies. Um, I know that some people like to do this in a Python script, and I guess my point is I can mostly do this in three commands, and that's why I'm sort of a command line person. Um, but then we can't use daily average because they're title signals, so I'm going to show you how to use subdaily, and then we'll take a break. Um, I originally wrote it in, uh, in I'm not sure I wrote it in the best way, but I'm going to show you how it works. The first section is looking for big outliers, getting rid of big outliers, and it's trying to give you a visual assessment of your data set. Unlike Quick Look, it's just, you know, look at one day. This is to give you a view of two weeks, a year, six months, um, and, and to try and help you determine whether you should change that mask. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. And it's also to let you know which constellations are helping and which are not. So it's not about getting rid of the little outliers and it doesn't do H dot, that's all done later. So this is like in daily average when it shows you what constellations are helping. In this case, a GPS is a bigger contributor than uh, Galileo or GLONASS, um, but Notice here we're over 220 measurements per day, whereas Simon uh, and Richard Ray and I had a previous study with only 35. So we're going to get a far better temporal resolution from this data set. Um, I, don't, this, I like these colors, but they don't always tell you much. In particular, this azimuth plot, Simon just showed you an example where it does tell you something. It tells you that on windy days, you only get uh, retrievals from I don't remember if it was the east versus the west and so on. So sometimes you'll see something like that in the azimuth. The amplitude plots, which are color-coded here, tell you whether it's ice or water. If you put in one year for a site in the poles, that would help you understand that part. The frequencies just tell you, again, which um, constellations. I added this one just because sometimes your azimuth mask is not as good as it should be and it can be difficult to figure out the colors over here. This only gives you very big color changes, but you might want to do better than that. And then in this case, when I taught the class last year, 
I went out to 240. And then I found there are all these red points over there. So it's just to help you have confidence um, in what your data set looked like. And then uh, there's just a summary that said, this is where we started, this is where we end up. You know, there just aren't that many outliers. It's removed four points out of two weeks. Um, the next thing it does is that R, that H dot correction. H dot and R H dot are the same. I shouldn't use both terms, I apologize. So it's just that, uh, you know, that in, in Simon's case, it was moving way more than this site. Um, here it's an effect that you can see, but it's not as huge. Now we're using a spline, so that assumes smoothness right there, but it's better than nothing. And, and Simon's right, you need to do something. Um, it also uses that spline to remove smaller outliers and, and remove the inner frequency biases. So one or two years ago, I don't even remember when, Simon, Felipe, and I had a Zoom call where we had, you know, made the decision that while we still aren't absolutely sure how to confidently remove that L1 bias because we see antenna effects, that different antennas are different, uh, we can sure remove the inner frequency biases, at least empirically, at many sites. So that's what's done here. So you're going to see an initial RMS, you're going to see an RMS after your RH dot correction, then you're going to see another RMS after you remove the inner frequency bias. Because I'm trying to show you these different steps, how they contribute to the improvements. And, and um, Simon's 100% correct that, you know, the, the LOMS gargles are not going to give you millimeter measurements. They're not going to give you centimeter measurements. They're not meant to be used. You're not meant to use one of them or three of them. You're meant to use hundreds of them per day. And you'll see the value of that when you do your tidal fits. But when you make these bias corrections, you are going to improve your solutions. Okay. And you won't see it going from 10 centimeters to two, but you might see it going from a 10 centimeter to eight centimeter. And that's a significant improvement. Um, so then it computes a new spline. And then Felipe asked me to, um, you know, the new spline actually allows you to uh, tie that to your orthometric height. And you control that new spline in terms of, if you want evenly sampled data, that's where you can get it. Now, it's a spline. I'm glad Simon said that. It ain't the truth. <laughs> it's you've smoothed. And, and so just keep that in mind. But if you want evenly sampled data and your site's got these nice tidal signals, it might be a perfectly good way to do it. Um, but you control that spine. Spline, not the spine. Uh, so we're now in part two. We've removed the outliers. The first thing it's going to do is fit a spline so it can calculate RH dot. And, and you can see, sorry, what it says here. If I'd done nothing, the RMS to the spline was 15 centimeters. When I correct for RH dot, it goes down to 11.3 centimeters. And then when I remove the inner frequency biases, it's a down to 8.2. Okay, so it started out like 15 something, then it was 11 something, now it's down to eight. All right. Uh, some people say, oh, I want a millimeter. Well, this isn't the system for you unless you're willing to look at it over the long term. Um, at this point, it's still trying to find outliers. So those are the red points it removes before it fits that final spline. And this is the one um, that uh, Felipe and I worked on over in January. Now, right now, you control the orthometric height that's used there, uh, but it will go ahead, if you don't tell it what you want, it will use your ellipsoidal height and an EGM-96 gravity model. Now, you can use another gravity model and do this yourself, but you're responsible for what your ellipsoidal height is. If you trust me to put in the one to be good to a millimeter, then that's not a good decision on your part. I'm giving you an approximate value that Jeff Blewett put on the internet. 
that is not a traceable, well, it is traceable, but that's not what a real geodesist would use. You're responsible for putting the correct ellipsoidal height. And if you want to use a different way to get that into sea level, that's great. Um, but this was our first effort to give people an easy way to put these heights into sea level measurements, if you will. And what we have to do is come up with a way that takes into account what uh, Simon showed you, which is that some sites, they're going up a centimeter per year, or they're subsiding a centimeter per year, or the, uh, the example he showed for MAYG, I don't even know what you call that behavior. It's not linear at all. I don't know how we'll get that signal into these, uh, into these measurements so we'd have absolute sea level, but at least by using GNSS data, we have a, a possibility to do that. So that's basically something that the community needs to come up with. Um, I don't even think the regular sea level people have decided what to do about their height gauges that are going up and down. I know they're very working very hard to measure that the ground around those tank gauges are going up or down. But the separate question is, what are you going to do with those numbers? I mean, are you only going to add slopes? Are you going to add the seasonal terms? Things like that. So I think that's all. I've got two more slides. Uh, somebody yesterday asked about accuracy. I've only talked about precision thus far. Uh, we haven't, I haven't done the final tie to the local tie gauge, but precision as determined by comparisons with splines is an attempt to determine precision, but it, a better precision is comparison to a, another tide gauge, and, and NOAA operates a tide gauge at SC02, and that's why people like it. As a comparison site, um, this is a correlation plot between the NOAA tide gauge and the GNSSIR tide gauge series has a very high correlation, 0.994. Part of that's influenced by there's a relatively large uh, tidal regime, but it's also, it's a good site. So there you go. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, it's seven after, so I'm going to start again in five minutes, and um, I'm going to turn, I'm going to stop my video, but I'll be back in five minutes, and then um, I'll finish this off, okay?
Okay, um, it's been about five minutes, so I'm going to start again. And um, all right, because we have a lot of stuff. So um, I'm really I'm glad Simon showed some results for this site, so I don't have to spend as much time on it. But uh, this is the picture of AC12. It was a PBO site that was installed to study volcanic deformation. So it was never, ever, ever anticipated to be a, a site that was used to measure sea level. However, it was set to track L2C because I asked them to do that. And it is also operating at one second. And I'm not sure if that was me or just in general, they did it to be um, to focus on science that could be done with one second data. Uh, the azimuth issue here, in addition to what uh, Felipe, I'm sorry, Simon showed you, um, is that, at least in my example, it can be a little hard to see, but there's actually land underneath some of these Fresnel zones. So some of these yellow Fresnel zones are hitting the other part of the island. And, and we're going to see that in the data. Um, and when I go to the maximum resolvable reflector height plot, which he already showed, and I, I'm just trying out five seconds, uh, you can see that you'll probably be okay with these L1, probably okay, but I'm a little conservative. So I went ahead and used two second data. Uh, when I converted the data, I decided to only use data below 10 degrees. And there is an option in RhinoX SNR that allows you to only save the data below 10 degrees, which for a tall site is all you're gonna need. And um, it's gonna make all your runs faster if you use it. Uh, the other thing is for some of the archives, I'll just comment, you have to tell it that you want high rate data. And you do that here by saying dash rate eight high. And that's because they keep the data in different folders. It has nothing really to do with the file names. It's just they put them in different folders, and I need help with that. Um, here's why I, why I showed you that that island is blocking certain azimuths. The blockage was to the south. And if you go ahead and throw this data into Quick Look, you can see that I have all these good blue um, areas, and then it falls apart right in the south where we expected it to fall, fall apart. Um, the other thing is, I wasn't sure what the amplitude value would be, so I turned it off. So you are perfectly, it's perfectly okay to set the amplitude to zero and just use peak to noise, which in this case looks like the blues are all well above four um, for what I, I'm doing it. Um, so I went ahead and made more files. At this time, there was only GPS L1 and L2. Um, so I went ahead and listed that, but there's no reason to put in Galileo or GLONASS. They weren't there. Uh, the other thing is, I, there's a missing space there, but the azimuth list has two separate regions because I'm avoiding that area to the south. And somebody asked about that yesterday. I don't know if he's on the call today. Um, but then everything's the same, except you see here that I have this dash SNR50, which is telling the code, I want you to use that high rate data in the uh, files that only have the data below 10 degrees. Then you consolidate the results using subdaily, just the station name and the year. You'll see that there are a lot fewer measurements than we just showed for SC02, which had over 200. Now at best, it's about 120, but that's because I only have GPS. Um, we don't need to look at that. Uh, but there aren't huge outliers. You can see that the precision appears to be about 17.5 centimeters. When you take the RH dot correction into account, it appears to be about 12.8 centimeters. And then when you remove the bias between L1 and L2, you're down to about 11. So you're not really worse off than you are at the... Um, site that was only about six meters from the water. So this would be an example of a site that when it's not too windy, you have a, you have a tide gauge where there isn't a tide gauge. Now, um, if you had a problem with long arcs, I just wanted to let you know that you can 
um, put in small arcs and you can use overlapping arcs and you can use shorter length arcs. That's all that can be all set in your JSON. And you can also do tests. You can make two different input analysis strategies and test them and compare them. Um, uh, Simon already showed this, but basically I went ahead and looked at what the data set looked like for this site when they put in a modern receiver. And what you basically see is now it's filled in because there are three different constellations contributing, but you also see a day here when the number of retrievals really uh, went down. And that's just because of the wind. Um, can you compare to other, can we compare with a tight gauge like we did in Friday Harbor? Unfortunately, we can't because there isn't one. So um, my last example, and I hope that I remember to go quickly here, is a river site, but it's a river site with tidal signals. And it's, it's a difficult site, even though it's pretty good in terms of having a good view of the water. Um, this is what the naive view would be in terms of the, uh, the, the view of the water, you'd think, oh, you can see in all 360 degrees. But as Simon says, sometimes it's the details, like where is the antenna with respect to obstructions? In this case, again, we're going to use the 15 second data because the BFG turned that on. We're going to use the rapid orbit, which gives me uh, GPS Galileo GLONASS. I'm going to use the Rhinex 3 name, uh, which is uh, the long one that includes the country code. Uh, this 15 seconds is because of the Nyquist maximum resolvable reflector height, which we can skip. Uh, I still went ahead and looked at my quick look results. Again, color means success. Uh, gray means not success. It usually just means the arc's very small. Uh, in this case, it all looks quite good. I mean, you do see some gray areas. And those gray areas, I didn't notice them from the photo, but when I zoomed in on my Google Earth image, there's, there's structures there in these azimuths. So I've, I've, I've put boxes around them just to remind you that you might initially think, oh, I can use all azimuths, but you should check uh, because sometimes you can't. And you don't want to use those azimuths. So, the input commands may look complicated, but basically it's just quantifying what you're seeing here. Remove these two azimuths, use peak to noise values you come from, that come from here. Perhaps you want to pick an amplitude value from here. Um, I'm going to use these elevation angle ranges and those height ranges. The command to estimate the reflector heights really just has the name, the year, and the days. And then to consolidate and turn them into water level, uh, you just say sub daily, the station name and the year. Um, I'm not using Galileo at all because really there were no data for Galileo because this is an older receiver. It's multi-GNSS, but it's one of the older receivers. So there's a limited number of channels. And so the uh, default of that receiver is G has been set up to pick GPS and GLONASS before it tries to use uh, Galileo. So the data just aren't there. Um, I mean, this isn't a huge problem, but you'll notice that there's missing data here. It isn't that there are outliers, but that's a suggestion that maybe at, this would be low tide, there's some um, obstructions. And, but again, this is a good data set, but it doesn't look like those tides at the other two sites. And we'll talk about that. It has much larger RMS with respect to the spline, 27 centimeters. When you take into account RH dot, you're down to 21. But you'll see these quite, you know, it looks like I'm overshooting, you know, not, it doesn't look random. It looks like I'm having a hard time with those peaks. Um, when I go ahead and remove the interfre interfrequency corrections, I still have some misfit, but it's down to about 17 centimeters. Um, so it's much worse than we showed for the other site. And it really has to do with the nature of the tides there, this is the official data set from the German government. I mean, these, these are very sharp changes in water level. And when you're trying to come up with the H dot there, and you might have an arc that spans down and then back up, 
I mean, I'm not sure what I'm, I mean, you can try to make the ranges smaller, the arc smaller, but it's still going to be an issue. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I have the best solution, but we're, we're doing pretty well. I would say that at this particular site, our agreement with the truth is better than with the spline. And that actually makes sense. The spline isn't true. Uh, the WSV, that's truth uh, because they have um, very good uh, records at this site. So this is the agreement between the tight gauge and GNSSIR. And it's not as good as the other side. It's only 0.98 correlation. And, and as I said, the RMS agreement here for one point is about 15 centimeters. So it's not as good as some of the others, but it is an, a challenging site. And I still have some ideas on how we can make that better, but um, it, this is where we are now. Um, so let's go back to Vessel uh, because now we've used subdaily. Now you can use subdaily on rivers and even lakes. But you have to remember, it's a river. Uh, you shouldn't be using the spline fits for RH dot on a lake or a river, or you should damp them. So just remember, there are knots, which is basically what it's allowing in this uh, fit. And um, it, it does have give, give you some information about your outliers. And so I, I see the interest in using so daily, but I would just ask you to use it um, with some care. Now this is using subdaily with that data set from the river. And the nice thing about subdaily is we're not using that medium filter, but we're using a spline and those outliers now are very easy to see. It isn't like we're just throwing a medium filter at it. Um, very clearly my azimuth ranges were not as good as they could have been. So, I can either let subdaily do that work or I can I can narrow the azimuth ranges and rerun it. And that's what in, in the end I, I did. Um, the other problem though with using a spline through that data is that it is overfitting. This is noise. Because I've allowed it to use eight splines per day. I mean, eight knots per day. So use fewer knots in rivers and lakes this is when you use a better analysis strategy and you also um, use knots of two. So two knots per day instead of eight. Sure, there's still a few outliers, but you see this part here, which was being thrown out when we use sub daily because it was moving too fast because we have too narrow of a medium filter. So you'll get, if you want sub daily, go ahead and use it, but use it better. And the um, RMS here is five centimeters, which is what um, Simon was saying is about the best you can do, or I can do. Uh, I just throw this out here. One of these is the official water level measurement. One is from GNSSIR. I mean, they're effectively the same with a five centimeter RMS. Um, to be honest, if you're just looking for the long-term behavior, you can just use the daily averages. But again, if you wanted to contribute to near real time uh, measurements of water level, you can use the code as is. It's good enough to do that. So I will stop there. Um, let's see if there's any questions, go ahead and please type them quickly. And I'm going to uh, tee up the next presentation now. Those are my examples for tides and rivers. And if one of my co-hosts will read questions, if there are any. But if there aren't. Uh, there is a question about uh, local Rhin using local Rhinex file. I can't understand the question. It says that what would be the pipeline if I want to use a local Rhinex file that I provide myself? Um, I think I I think oh, I understand the question now. Um, you have to name the file the way I like it. So there's a page on Christine's rules, which is to use the same file name conventions that are in uh, all the formats, all the GNSS archives all over the world. Then you need to put it in uh, the right file folder. So that would be 
reflection code slash year slash Rhinex slash station name. So that's the answer to that. If it's Rhinex 2, if it's Rhinex 3, just go into the code. There's a follow the link for Rhinex to SNR, and there's a section on how to analyze your own data. It's a good question. It can be challenging, especially for the people using NMEA, but for Rhinex, I think the documentation tells you exactly where to go. It's a good question. Um, there's nothing stopping you from using your own data other than file names and putting the files in the right place. Right? Those are the two things. I, I can show something about that if, if there's time. Okay, well, let me start on, I wanna show David Purnell's stuff. So I'm gonna okay. share screen. And so David was very kind to share uh, last time, his, uh, his slides from last time. And um, I have updated them. Uh, can you see something that looks like it's a, uh, oh, that, did, are you guys seeing something that's a short course inverse SNR? Yep. Okay. It's PowerPoint, so it's it looks different for me. Um, ooh, I don't like it at all, because I, anyway. Do you now see what is it? What is inverse SNR? You're on presenter view. I'm sorry? It's doing presenter view. Oh, so, so you're not just seeing one slide, you're seeing all of them? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Well, I'll say end show. Anybody know how to get it to just do what I want, which is to just look at one slide at a time? Uh, do that, press that again. There's what there says swap displays. If you've got two displays running. Oh, let's try that again. Okay, are you seeing one slide now? Yeah. Okay, uh, that my colleague was looking in another screen, so I just removed her. <laughs> I just removed her cable. So, okay. I'm going to talk about this uh, inverse SNR method that was developed originally by Traumers, and Dave has uh, taken some of that work and 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 he provided the code to GNSS Reflect, so you're able to use it. And this is this least squares method that Simon was alluding to. It's an, instead of doing a periodogram for each rising and setting arc, you cast the problem as a least squares problem that estimates water level at certain intervals, and 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 it has a nice um, has a it has some nice features. It has some limitations. The nice feature is you do get out a sea level that a record that's evenly sampled. And, and it uses the strength of the data. If you have simultaneous measurements of sea level, you get one sea level for that time period, whereas in LOMS gargles or periodograms, you get multiple. Um, so I'm going to skip through some of this, uh, but point you to these two papers that this work is um, built on. And then I'm going to actually skip most of what he talked about, but basically it is estimating water levels directly from the SNR data rather than using these periodograms. I think that's a fair thing to say. So these are these are the same equations that he already should that Simon already showed. Um, he gave us this data, he gave us this code right during Omicron. So that means two years ago. Um, it was single frequency, I think, at that point. So I added multi-frequency and various things like he didn't have a refraction correction in there. And uh, and the quality control is not identical. So that's unfortunate, but it, it does a pretty good job. And what he does is he computes the loms gargle periodograms first as a comparison point. Um, so here's the example, the same one I showed. Again, you're, he, he was good enough to read in the data files we were already producing. So you still use Rhinex to SNR. Uh, the difference is instead of GNSSIR input, you use inverse SNR input, but it should look familiar to you. Same height limits, same elevation angle limits, in this case, same azimuth limits. And then instead of running a program called GNSSIR, he's going to have a program called inverse SNR. 
And it's still going to run by, um, you know, beginning day of year to end day of year. In this case, he, he only wanted to look at the L1 data. And he uh, wasn't saving the peak to noise limit earlier. I'm going to change that, but that's fine. That's just a detail. Um, and what you get out of that is this curve here. So it is a three, 15, 16, 17, four days. And he's got the three L1 signals, GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS. And the dots are not his measurements. Those are the LOMS gargle periodograms from his code. And then his measurement of water level is inverse mod, right? And he has a cubic spline in there, just sort of like my spline, but his measurements are the black dot. Now the problems with this is it's really slow, like much slower than using periodograms. Um, I, like I said, I went ahead and made it multi-frequency. Uh, so in this case, I've added, you know, more GLONASS, more Galileo, and again, you know, even though he and I are not doing the same things, the cubics, for example, he doesn't do the H dot correction for the periodograms like we do. And he doesn't take out the interfrequency biases, which I showed you are not zero. They're not zero, but he does put out a really nice fit to the data. And for some places, this, if you don't have data gaps, you might want to use this. I like it. it has some it has some good features. Um, he added last time that there are these risky issues when there are um, if there are data gaps. And it's a problem. It will explode if you have data gaps. Now, when he gave me the code, I think it exited when you had a gap. and I added in, well, is it do you want to take a risk? And it's a Boolean, and you can take a risk. Uh, this is what it looks like for L1 when you don't have data gaps. I think that's what the, wait, OK. What he did was he said, let's make a risk by just removing the azimuth, changing them. Instead of being from 60 to 220, he did 60 to 120, which is OK if you use a not space of every, uh, every three hours. Uh, but if you change it, in this case, to being a knot every hour, right? Think about that. It explodes. This is actually how the cubic splines explode. Um, and you see here it says risky true. The code originally said, don't do this. You don't want to do this. And it exited. But, you know, if you want to see what it looks like, you can set risky to true. And, and I don't even show what his inverse SNR code does because... It goes off scale and you can't see anything. It explodes even worse than the cubic splines. So this is not a method for data with gaps. At the end of the day, all data have gaps. So that's a problem. The other problem is what to do with the uh, end of the endpoints. I swear to you that when you do the next four days, these will not line up. They just won't. And, and so you have to decide what to do about that. Um, but I want to also point out where a place where I think it has a, it's a, it's kind of a, at least it's visually a better system. And I don't know if the group in Mexico is on the call today, but I, I thought I'd show this result from TGMX. Just a comment. I hate how they put this site next to all this junk. Um, it unfortunately hasn't worked for a couple of years. But it's co-located. This is the traditional tide gauge. It's a small tidal signal. Remember in Germany, it was four meters peak to peak. And in Friday Harbor, FC02, it was three or four meters per day. Um, Simon showed you 12 meters per day. You know, here it's 20, 30 centimeters, 20 or 30 centimeters. And remember, Simon and I have both emphasized it's not unusual to get points with 10 centimeter uncertainties on them in this you know, periodic gram approach. And sure enough, when I use a periodic gram approach, those are my blue dots. I mean, I can fit a spline to it. I don't know if it's right or not. I mean, maybe it is, but I don't know. And here, if I don't know what I'm doing, I mean, I, I control that spline, but I'm not sure what to make it. 
Um, this is using inverse SNR. I still don't know for sure that uh, the spline settings are right, but you know, to be honest, it looks pretty darn good. It, 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 I think those are gonna overlay each other really well. So in places where the signal is tiny, uh, this method, I think because it combines arcs that are at the same time, you're gonna get a better result for tiny signals, or you might. Um, so that's my comment for that. I didn't spend a lot of time on this because um, it doesn't work everywhere, but it sure is nice. It's nice that we have this code and I, I really appreciate David providing it. I would, again though, caution you, it's so slow on high rate data, you will never use it on high rate data. So you have to be careful about which sites you use it on. All right, so we are gonna now stop sharing. And I think at this point, I'm gonna give it to, I believe I'm gonna give it to Simon to talk about PSMSL, is that right? Yes. <laughs> sure, sure I will. And then maybe Felipe and then McCone, does that sound right? Did I forget anybody? Absolutely. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So the permanent service for mean sea level is the global data bank for long-term sea level change from tide gauges and bottom pressure recorders. It's hosted by us at the NOC here in uh, Liverpool. As part of the uh, what was called the EURACY project, we had the opportunity to build up a data bank of sites around the world that are that we can get GNSSIR uh, tide gauge data from. And so that is what I'm going to show you here. So if you go to the PSMSL website, which is what we can see here, and go to data, you'll find a thing, a section that says GNSSIR records. So we can go on there. And this is this new GNSSIR portal. So it gives us um, several things. So we've got a map showing all the, the GNSSIR sites around the world that we've managed to get uh, sea level information from. There's a bit about uh, explanation of the technique again, and what did we do in this to create the files that we've got, um, and some other various examples of how we calculate daily means in this case. Um, so I'll go straight to the map. So this is the map of GNSSIR sites around the world. We've also included ones so most of the ones are in white. They're good sites generally. The reflectometry works well and the data are available. So most, if not all of the sites on here, you can get from the different archives that Christine talked about and that the software can access. Uh, there are ones in yellow, but are ones that sites have been decommissioned, but they did work well when it was operating. And we got two others, uh, a red and a black in this case. Um, so the red ones are sites that, uh, were looked at, but, uh, were found questionable. Maybe the reflectometry works slightly, but not enough, or the signal is very weak. Um, so we flagged them as red. It's kind of a, a an attempt to stop pe other people repeating, looking at some of those sites because you're not really going to get anything from there. And then we have our bad sites. Um, what we want to do at some point is actually say why we think they're bad or even questionable. Um, it doesn't say anything at the moment, so but it could be bad because there's no data available at the site, um, or that the positioning isn't actually that good, uh, or you know the environment's too bad for it, um, or that they haven't included signal to noise ratio in their Rhinex files, or that the data sampling is inadequate. It's it's above the uh, the reflector height is above the the sampling, the maximum reflector height. So we can go and look at, and in this case, we'll do breast. Uh, so you can click on that, it gives you some information. 
of the IGS code for it, uh, who provides the data for that site. Um, and we get a plot like this. So a little bit more information, uh, what the ellipsoidal height is and the ellipsoidal height epoch, the reflector height, links to the SOML website. Oh, I'll show you the SOML website as well in a second and other links there. So we get a plot of the daily data here and we get the file. You can download the file in zip data file directly there. And if there's tie gauge information nearby, also plot the daily tie gauge as well. And then we get a little bit of statistics on what uh, signals and systems are actually used at that point and the number of observations. So as Christine said for SCO2, start that with just having GPS um, data and then quickly added GLONASS and Galileo and Beidou. In fact, probably let's go to, uh, let's go to SCO2 on here. No. There we are. So the same sort of thing gives a, a very similar plot of the Fresnel zones. Except for it's drawn slightly different, but it's basically the same thing where we're taking the data from. This calculates it on the fly from the actual results. It just takes the results and knows where and what elevation angles are used and what azimuths are in the, in the results file. And again, there we can see that GPS was used up to about 2016 only, and then we start getting the bonus in Galileo. And of course, the, the number of observations has gone up from 25 or so at the start up to at least 150. Some of the sites now, um, you can get somewhere, if you can get 360 azimuth, you can get over a thousand measurements per day. So that's a quick, so you can use this site, you know, to actually download the data if you're interested in that. In that. Um, or you can use it to see whether the site you're thinking of has already been processed and whether it works well, um, or if it's not in the system, uh, you know, can you get the data and can you use it? We're constantly updating this as more sites come through. And although it's a mean sea level, we do include uh, the rivers and lakes that we've been processing. So um, one of the other just wanted to say one thing, just in case you can just click on Simon's website and get his zip file, but you can also use a GNSS reflect utility called Download Tides. And one of the archives that is supported there is Simon's and his is just PSMSL. As long as you know the station name, you can get that file and it'll rewrite it in the same file format that I use for NOAA and IOC. So I also support downloads from NOAA and IOC and uh, the WSV in Germany. I'm not sure who else I do, but just in case you wanted to download Simon's code, but you already had NOAA code, NOAA files too, you could get them in a common format. Okay. okay. So one of the sites that's uh, relevant to the GPS at tie gauge is the Sunel site. So that's uh, this one here. Uh, they have, it's a combination of tie gauges and GPS there. So this is their map of GPS sites. Not all the, this is not reflectometry, this is GPS at tie gauges. So, or near to tie gauges. But in the same vein, you know, you can zoom in and see all these sites. And what you'll find they've added recently is that if you see, click on breast again, uh, choose which one is breast. You can click on there. Uh, you can download. You can download thirty seconds data from here. So it gives you information how much data it's got. It's got 30 seconds Rhinex data that you can download from. Uh, it also gives you solutions on the, the actual GPS positions. But they've added this new tag in here, <clears throat> GNSSIR. So it says that it's a GNSSIR site. And that then links back to the PSMSL website. So it's a good one to see whether there's data for there and whether it's actually been recognized as a reflectometry site. Um, the other thing is if you'd like to uh, recompute the recompute the reflector heights for any of these sites, Sonel is one of the archives supported by GNSS Reflect. So if you're trying to learn how to do this, you could do them yourself and compare to what Simon has posted. 
I mean, give you better confidence uh, in what you're doing if you compare with his. Yeah, and I'd say one other thing, they often have a photo album, which is quite nice, just to see what the site looks like, quick look, which is always good. And um, they do have, if there is actually leveling and datums available for a site, they'll give you that information too. So you can then start looking at that reference frame uh, differences between your results and what it says it's, what reference frame it thinks it's in. So I will leave it there. Um, so I'll probably just keep zooming on. So uh, Felipe, do you want to talk for maybe five minutes or do you want to um, skip it or what would you like? Oh, now I can't. For the case anyone is using a lot of uh, okay. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, so just a heads up for anyone um, interested in using non-geodetic navigation type. Normally we put out in uh, uh, year, uh, month, day, and uh, Christine's uh, software package expects in uh, day of year. So you would have to uh, rename them. That's, that's basically it. Um, we have this demo, it has to be uploaded uh, to be posted on the read the docs. But uh, that's something that uh, a PhD student of mine, Manuela Focus, prepared, and she went first, and then she, she does uh, one week so that for uh, anyone who has not done this before. Uh, knows uh, instead of uh, doing a full year of data. And and here, what she highlights is the importance of selecting the azimuth because um, you get reflections from the water and you get reflections from the ground. And obviously you need to, to set up a proper mask. So that's that's all I had to, to share at the moment. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, so I think the next person, uh, Makan, if you'd like to uh, make your spiel, and then um, I will do a sum up, and then we'll take more questions. All right. Okay. So can you see my screen, Kristen? Yes, I can. All right. So. So glad to be here. So I wanted to share this announcement with you all. So uh, uh, we have recently expanded the scope of uh, First Genesis R Working Group, which was previously chaired by Sajjad Tabibi and Felipe. So we're going to include a new focus on climate application. So this working group is now a part of in Inter-Commission Committee on Geodesy for Climate Research, ICC which I'll be chairing uh, together with uh, Don Ko Peng uh, from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So we have around 19 members, including expert in Genesis IR community and its application. So uh, our, our working group uh, 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 has seven uh, objectives, and we are particularly interested in collabor collaborating on, um, let's say, technical improvement of Genesis IR models and, and maintaining and creating inventories of site that has been or been used uh, to measure a uh, climate uh, variable. So uh, also we are interested uh, with increasing the attention on low-cost sensors. So uh, this is one of our uh, focus uh, objective. Also, we aim to uh, upgrade and maintain software while developing use cases um, uh, in climate uh, application. So we have uh, two main pro uh, program of uh, uh, activity that can be relevant uh, here. One is the online uh, webinar uh, series uh, together with short course, but it's not going to be very frequent, perhaps one or two or three per, per year. And we're going to do sessions in international conferences and uh, dedicated uh, uh, session in ICC workshops. So uh, if, if you would like uh, uh, 
to stay informed about our activity, please sign up for our mailing list using the link below here. So I copy the link to the chat box so we can keep you posted about upcoming events, uh, short courses and other events. All right, yeah, that's all from me. Okay, um, I'm going to make this uh, presentation available to everyone. So don't worry if you don't get this address. Could you unshare, please? Sure. Um, so I'm going to put my final things on the screen. Let's get rid of this PowerPoint that annoys me. And I have my day two welcome and I have my day two goodbye. So let me now uh, share a screen and, and, and we can finish up and answer questions. Uh, so I'm going to try to share a screen. Day two goodbye. Yes? Someone has suggested uh, posting the Q&A on the website. Uh, if it is saved, I, I will do that. I, I, you know, I really don't understand webinars, so I will do my best. How about that? If anybody else, if any of my co-hosts know how to <laughs> save, save that, then go right ahead and do it. But otherwise, I'll just have to try. Um, so uh, I think this is my goodbye. Okay. So I, this is my hope. I hope that you'll consider contributing to this community effort. Um, there's lots of ways you can do that. Some people are good with Python and uh, I would appreciate any help there. I'm not very good with Python and uh, so I appreciate any help. Um, you have to write documentation though. You cannot write new code and ask me to accept it unless you've provided documentation. So I will say that. Um, but you can also just ask questions and report bugs. Uh, that is helping. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, correcting errors in the documentation. It's been hard to maintain the software because there's a lot of documentation, but every time we try to improve the software, we have to make sure that we have improved, fixed the documentation. Uh, and improving the models. Uh, I'm very happy that we're going to have a new refraction model soon coming out of Chalmers, and I'm going to work on that as soon as this class is over, but the code was provided to me by the, um, the night model people. Uh, another uh, participant who's not on this call, unless he likes to get up at three in the morning, has an idea to make the code faster. So I'm working with uh, him on that. So I have uh, gotten some offers. Uh, I think one of the questions in the Q&A was, does significant wave height, is that something done here? Not yet. Uh, if, once that model has been tested and is trustworthy and it's in Python, I'd love to have it here. Um, yeah, I, I will not port your code from MATLAB anymore. I, I think another way you can help people is to encourage your colleagues to share data I know that's not the norm in all agencies and countries, but I think it, it should be as much as possible. Um, and even if all you do is go back to your colleagues and explain to them why some of their stations can't be used, that, that would be helpful because people often don't realize um, that it matters which side of the dock they put their GPS site on. Uh, I'll make my spiel for at least to Americans. You know, this refusal to track L2C is really embarrassing. It's an American satellite constellation. These are modern signals. And to continue to only track the signals that were developed in the 1970s is really silly. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just move on. Uh, share your utilities. I've got utilities that some of you may not realize are there. So I encourage you to look under the uh, quick recall section of the documentation. Uh, there might be a utility there that you can use, like the download tides utility. Um, also, you could share Python functions that replace the command lines for people that don't want to use the command lines. Uh, just as examples, I can't personally maintain any more new stuff like that, but I'm happy to host it on GitHub. And um, I get asked about classes, but they can't happen without support from the community. And uh, 
and that's why we're not covering snow or uh, soil moisture in this class. I, we just don't have enough people in the community to help us teach the class. So, um, and finally, my plan is to add all of you to the information list. And if you don't want me to, just let me know. I won't believe me. I won't be. I won't be upset in the slightest if you tell me not to. Um, and also, there's a, a unsubscribe at the bottom. So don't worry about it. But that is my. Um, that is my plan. So I'm going to stop the share and um, let's answer questions for, I don't know, another five, 10 minutes. And then I will try to save the Q&A, but I'm not sure how to do it. <laughs> Can anybody read questions? Um, there was a question about how, how can we check time series of SNR? What's that so mean? My, uh, just the raw data. Uh, and my take on that, you you have to load the SNR files yourselves in Python and plot it manually. I don't think we offer any utility, do we? Well, there, so if you just want to see the SNR data, you can say quick plot, mm -hmm. the file name, and then you give it two parameters, the x-axis column, and the y-axis column. So uh, the SNR file, say L1, is in column seven, and time is in column four. So you could say quick plot the SNR file four and seven will give you that time series as a function of seconds of day. If you wanted to see the same plot for elevation angle, you'd say quick plot file name two seven. If you wanted to see a plot of say azimuth versus elevation angle, uh, Simon showed that, but there was a mountain in front of the site, and that's why you couldn't see some of the signals. You would say quick plot, file name three, two, because azimuth's in column two and elevation angle two. Sorry, three and then two. I mean, I wrote quick plot because every time I had to make a plot in Python, I just, you know, was sweating. It, I, I didn't know how to do it. So I finally just made myself a utility that I could do quick plots. And uh, you're welcome to use it. If one of your columns is modified Julian Day, which many tight cage people do, if that's your x-axis, you say dash MJD true, and it makes a nice, you know, uh, time label for you if you don't, you know, know modify Julian Day by heart. <laughs> so do we have um, things that let you look at individual tracks? Not really, but on QuickBook, you can tell it to only look at a single satellite. So it doesn't show you the SNR, but it shows you the individual LOMS gargles. If you're willing to do it, you can also say GNSSIR, station name, year, day of year. You can say dash sat, whatever satellite you want to look at, and it'll show you the SNR data for that satellite, and it'll show you the LOMS gargles for that satellite. If you want to look at all the SNR data on that data, it shows you all the data, and it also shows you all the LOMS gargles. But that's, you have to run GNSSIR to get that. It, it's only a few seconds, but it takes you time. And it will look at each frequency separately. You'll get a new plot for each one. So there is some, but not tons, of um, uh, raw SNR data I look at very infrequently but sometimes. So there's a question here. There's an option to configure the uh, direct signal removal. Um, how do you set that up? I actually just use five to 30 on everything. And if, uh, the, if you wanna go down to three degrees, I just change it to be from three to 30. Um, you control the polynomial order. And I just encourage you to try different things. It's actually almost meaningless if you look at really, really high rate. You know, if you look at for really tall sites, the direct signal is just meaningless. But at some of the shorter sites, it can be nuanced, not typically for the sea level ones, but for uh, snow and soil moisture in particular. Um, it's not a parameter we talk about too much. I don't encourage people to change it. but you are welcome to try and change it. It's just a simple polynomial. Any other um, 
So here's a question. Oh, okay. They're saying thank you. Well, you are welcome. Uh, will there be some explanation courses and program development about significant wave height? Um, I'm, I think I'm going to answer that as I'm happy to host code that other people write to solve that problem. I'm not personally planning to do that. I'm not funded to do any of this. I'm retired. I'm not planning to run a short course on that either because I don't know the answer. But um, I think it's a really interesting application. Simon's results are great, and so are the others. Um, and certainly there might be a chance to do short courses, not short courses, but maybe just, you know, maybe a one or two hour Zoom on one particular thing. That might be a nice thing to do, but I'm not I'm not aware of any. Are you guys aware of any? No, I don't think it's ready just yet to to open it up to most people. It's still in development a lot. Um is there, will there be, a, here's a question, will there be a group chat where we can exchange questions and learn from each other? So that sounds to me a little bit like Slack and I just can't, my band, I just can't take anymore. <laughs> so I think it's Slack's a great thing, but I just can't take it anymore. I'm not sure what would be a better way to do it. You can write, raise issues on GitHub and if you do, I almost always answer them. I mean, it's a, a rare time that I don't answer them. So that, if you want to get my feedback, I'm going to make you use GitHub issues because then other people who have the same question can see my answer. And um, do you guys have any other ideas on how we can answer questions from people? I mean, I've told Makan that, you know, his group should sponsor a Zoom session. You don't have to call it a short course on cheap sensor deployments. I think that would be really useful, um, but I'm not going to myself. Yeah, we have a plan to do that. So we will inform uh, the members uh, to the, the mailing links. We have set it up. Sure, we do that. Right, so I'm going to add your names to the, uh, I have a list of a thousand people that have either taken a class or expressed interest in this method, and so we'll have, you know, a couple hundred more names now, and uh, like I said, you can unsubscribe, and, and that would be the place I tell people if those opportunities are there. There are limited opportunities in other kinds of meetings like AGU or EGU. In general, uh, AGU has not been a good place for discussions about this method. There's just not enough activity in the United States. Uh, EGU, a little bit more, but often it's been split into different um, sections. Like there'll be a few in oceans, a few in soil moisture, and there'll be a few in snow. and you know, so there's no one place. And, and I think, so a lot, the technique doesn't get talked about as much as the science applications. And um, there is a international group as well, dominated by engineers, but they only really want to talk about space reflections. They just don't care about in situ data. So it's, you know, it's a different community. And I'm not really sure how to get us together other than, you know, this virtual method. I do appreciate that people came and, and I know it wasn't a good time zone for a lot of people, but still a lot of people came. Any other questions? I think we're pretty much Done. So do you guys have any um, suggestions on how I can save this Q&A? Because I really don't know how to do it. It should be in the log of the, the it report. Be, it should it's be supposed to be a report and it's in there, apparently. We, we will see. Uh, I don't know how to do it otherwise. I can okay. copy and paste a load of it as well. Though, so. I feel like if people could see and hear us, <laughs> I have done my job. Um, 
All right, thank you all for coming to this. I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, and thank you to our panelists um, for helping out. I really, 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 really appreciate it. So goodbye from Bonn, Germany. Goodbye.